So please start. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. And, and I, I took some liberties with this talk. So it's a, uh, it really is going to be historical as well as, as speculative. And it's more computer science-y than I usually do. So I, I figured uh, that would be fun. Um, Nicholas is right. I had to hide the fact that I you know, got a PhD in artificial intelligence and, and started the machine learning group at the National Library of Medicine for many years. Those were dirty words and through the depths of those, those uh, bad parts of the hype cycle. It's really quite entertaining to be back in the modern world where all of a sudden everybody's an expert in machine learning and it's going to solve all of our problems and take all of our jobs. Um, but I, I'm going to try to avoid the, the really scary stuff until right at the end. Um, and just talk about the path that we have taken. And I want to take you down a sort of, not the historic path I want to go down is because people don't often take computer science as science. Um, they think of it really as just technology that we got and we just bought this or learned how to do that. And I want to sort of show some of the scientific questions that have driven computational work in language or what we often call natural language processing. And that really starts off in, in 1936 um, with uh, the Turing machine. And the reason that we call it natural language processing is because there's, the rest of computer science uses these unnatural languages, these programming languages. And in 1936, this was really the, the first idea that it was possible to have a language. It was uh, Turing's definition of a Turing machine, a formal language uh, that, could, that could specify a set of computations. And it was a new kind of symbolic communication. Up until that point, symbolic communication had been limited to people, or perhaps if you have a more generous interpretation, you could think about uh, elephants or, or vervet monkeys or the like. But by and large, symbolic communication was something that happened between uh, human beings and, and between minds. And what Turing defined was the sequence of mathematical operations uh, written down um, as, a, as a sequence of, of symbols. And those symbols specify what you're seeing here. This is a little GIF animation of a, of a Turing machine. Um, and the, it had all kinds of interesting aspects to it. So uh, the idea of this was long before computers were a physical object. In this era, in the 1930s, computers was a job profession. It was mostly women who did calculations, uh, largely of missile trajectories and, and stuff like that. Um, but Turing's paper that defined the Turing machine um, this idea of a universal machine. He was trying to prove something about the halting problem, a fundamental aspect of computer science. Um, but the, this machine uh, was a, a tape and a head um, and a set of instructions, very precise instructions. And the instructions were to be done by computer, that is, by the human being who would follow them, as Turing put it, desultorily, um, uh, in order to, to do this formal thing. And he, because it was all finite and written down and formal, he could prove things about it. And so... Uh, this was really about mathematical operations, and computing for many years was thought of as a purely mathematical thing. Um, but Turing immediately saw that there's a relationship to human language, that this symbolic language might have something to do with human language, and he wrote this famous article uh, asking the questions, can machines think? That's before we started calling it artificial intelligence. I'll get to that. And the can machines think article um, described the relationship between these formal languages and human languages and the invention of the imitation game, the Turing test. I won't go into it now, but it's really interesting to look at the imitation game in that original article because it was about could men imitate women and then could you substitute a computer in for the man and could the computer imitate women. Um, and the gender angle is fascinating. Uh, Turing's history is, is all fascinating. I recommend it, but I'm not going to talk more about it today. I'm going to jump to 1956 and Noam Chomsky. So in, in 1956, Chomsky explicitly claimed that human language was a formal language. Okay? And he built this hierarchy of formal languages, which you may be familiar with here. Um, that was uh, the ascent of, of different kinds of languages that you could distinguish from each other. So the type 3 language I'm sure you're pretty familiar with, that's regular expressions, Perl. Anybody programmed in Perl? Yeah, a few? Uh-huh. Anyway, regular expressions can be implemented by a finite state automata. Um, it's basically some sequence of symbols being emitted. First one symbol, then another, then another, then another. And then you can actually do things that say the symbols depend on each other somehow. And the next state up is this context-free kind of dependence between symbols. Um, where uh, I, can, I don't have to pay too much attention to what's gone on before me, but I can emit, say, a pair of symbols together. So I could, I could have a sequence of five A's and five B's. And uh, a language that generated those kinds of things is context-free. 
Um, there is some argument that occasionally human language gets up to context sensitive. Um, so when you talk about something respectively, you would need context sensitive. So uh, if I were going to say the square root of 16, 9, and 4 are 4, 3, and 2 respectively, in order to line up the 4 and the 2 and the 9 and the 3 and the 4 and the 16, uh, you need a context sensitive language. Um, and then as Turing showed, basically any language is in this recursively enumerable part. There's a, a little bit of, of Gettle proof that shows that if you, some things are not recursively enumerable, but basically everything. And so Chomsky made this claim um, that human language uh, was described by this, this kind of, of logic, of grammar. Um, it was very exciting in the 1950s, the idea that we might bring mathematics to understanding language uh, caused a, a real uh, uh, revolution. Um, and uh, in many ways, it led to the birth of artificial intelligence. Um, that happened in, uh, the term was coined in, in 1956, same year that paper came out. And uh, it was by these, this group of people, so uh, John McCarthy on the left, uh, Herb Simon and Alan Newell and Marvin Minsky, sort of the, the fathers of artificial intelligence. Um, and their claim was that intelligence is symbolic reasoning. Okay, it's the ability to take symbols and manipulate them in ways to generate other symbols. And they thought intelligence was basically things like solving logic puzzles and playing chess, the sort of things that smart white guys like them did in the 1950s. And so that's what intelligence was. And so he could write computer programs that would solve logical problems and play chess. And that would be a theory of, of intelligence. Um, and it, uh, the analysis of language was all rule-based, trying to program transformational grammars um, to, to put, lang put language into some sort of uh, base form that, where it could be understood by computers. Um, and uh, it really took the world by storm, at least for uh, 30 years or so. Um, it caused an enormous fight at MIT. So there was a real battle between the reasoning folks, Noam Chomsky there is, is on the left, who said it's all about symbolic manipulation and logical inference, and, and, and because it, uh, these things were hard to learn, um, it was innate, um, and people just had this stuff built into them somehow. And it was a, that was all a big fight against this old guard uh, who came from cybernetics, the guy in the center, as Norbert Wiener, the inventor of cybernetics, which was really all about feedback and learning and control systems. Um, and it took advantage of um, a couple of other things that would, f that would fuse with it only later. Um, the, the guy on the second from the right uh, is Warren McCulloch, who is a neuroscientist who came up with the first mathematical model of a neuron uh, with uh, Walter Pitts. And then the one on the far right is Donald Hebb, who came up with the first learning rule for artificial neurons or for mathematical neurons. And so there was this huge uh, battle at MIT over who was, who was really, um, was it these upstart computer scientists and their symbolic reasoning, or was it this old guard cybernetics and, and these neural things? And there was a series of really vicious papers that went back and forth. They're kind of fun to look back at now. There's a guy named Mark Gold, who in 1967 published a paper on the unlearnability of the upper reaches of the Chomsky hierarchy. So positive examples alone are not enough to learn a context-sensitive grammar. Um, and so, you know, it was unlearnable, and so that couldn't be a good explanation of language. And then Chomsky came back and said, oh, no, we have this innate language organ in our heads, and, uh, you know, people like Pinker still believe that. In 1969, uh, Minsky and Papert published a book on perceptrons that showed that these artificial neural network things, the early versions of modern artificial neural networks, uh, couldn't learn nonlinearly separable functions. The example they used was exclusive or. And it really shut down research in perceptrons for 20 years. If it can't learn exclusive or, what's the point of trying this? Um, and so there were these battles that went back and forth. And um, I came into this in the 1980s. I was a student of Roger Shanks, that guy in the color picture, and Bob Abelson, a social psychologist. Um, and they had these sort of scruffy theories. So the semantics mattered more than syntax. Chomsky was wrong. It wasn't really about syntax. Um, we need psychological and social models of of not only behavior, but also of learning. And so they weren't uh, neural network sort of models, but they were very about dynamics and about learning. Um, how, to, how memory changes with experience and how our goals for doing things in the world drive the kind of learning we do. My PhD thesis in the 1980s was a, a theory of goal-driven learning. How do we come to want to learn particular things? A little theory of curiosity. And one of the things that has, has echoed through was this idea that we have these goals or questions in our head, 
um, and that over time, by reading something or having experience, some questions get answered, but new ones get posed. And so understanding is this, this process of changing the questions or changing the goals for knowledge that we have in our heads. And these theories actually held up reasonably well. I still use this stuff in, in current things. Um, but we had this little problem where the money all went away twice. Um, notice one of those is 1988. That's where I got my PhD, 1988. So I had to run away. <laughs> Couldn't do computer science anymore. Um, I ended up going to the National Institutes of Health, which had big computers and, um, and some problems that they thought maybe computer scientists might help with. This is in the very early days of, of gene sequencing. Um, so I went to the National Library of Medicine, started the machine learning project, and, and very slowly lost my identity as a computer scientist and became more and more of a biologist. Um, and really enjoyed that. It's been a great run. Um, and uh, while I was busy trying to use these techniques, trying to do useful things for biology and medicine, um, some changes happened in, in artificial intelligence. One of the most important ones um, was this idea that it could be empirical. Um, a lot of papers used to be published in my era, of, old era of, of AI, um, which is my method works best for this problem that I pose myself. And computer science has a lot of that flavor. Um, it's hard to, put, to prove very general things. Um, and so with the, the, all these papers proving that my method was best for the problem I invented, it became very hard to compare them. And so in 1987, a guy named David Aha built this Irvine collection of machine learning problems and test sets. You can see the UCI machine learning repository logo up there, still going. But really had a dramatic effect on the field in the, in the 80s and, and 90s, um, and to the point where uh, nowadays, we always think about leaderboards and evaluations and the like. And so this is a good example um, of a set of leaderboards in artificial intelligence, natural language processing, computer, computer vision, lots of particular problems in image classification or sentiment analysis or machine translation that have solved uh, versions. And then you can run your program against these standards and see how well they do. And we get a real sense of, of uh, which kind of thing works best. And it's not just on the program, my program works best on the little example that I generated myself, but it's my program works best on these important, uh, reasonably large, reasonably representative data sets. And over the 50 years or so, good Lord, it's hard to say that, that this has been going on, um, we've really made some progress, okay? We've learned what works. And what works, hands down, is learning. And so this piece of, of neuronal mathematics um, which is really describing the backpack al algorithm, I'll go through it in a second, uh, turns out to be tremendously important. And uh, you've probably seen these a million times, but this is what a deep learner looks like. Deep meaning is it has multiple hidden layers in it. We have some input that we'll give it. Uh, sometimes these are vectors of real numbers, sometimes they're binary. We have some output, we'd like to know, this is the supervised setting. Each one of these units works like this. It has its set of inputs, a set of weights uh, over those inputs, a sum of those weights here, um, and then some nonlinear phi here um, that transforms them. Uh, it doesn't really matter too much what this is. We used to think it mattered a lot, and we built these sigmoidal functions and use arc tangent and all that sort of stuff. These days, we just use a, a rectifier. So it's zero. if it's below zero, you get zero. Otherwise, you get the number that came in. That works just as well. Any nonlinear transformation is fine. It's much easier to calculate. Um, uh, this just has to be differentiable, and not even everywhere differentiable. The rectilinear one is not differentiable at zero, but it doesn't matter. Um, and so the reason it needs to be differential is the way you train these. How do you pick the weights to do these calculations? So you have a bunch of examples where you have an input. You know what the output should be. You calculate the difference. You, with, you start off with random weights. Um, and then you, can cal you see what the, the output gives you and what the difference is between the output and what you wanted. And then you can calculate the, the uh, partial of the error with respect to each weight um, in this relatively simple way. And then you add a, a learning rate and say, I'm going to change the weight a little bit uh, in, the error, in the direction that would reduce the error. Repeat this about 100 million times. And you get a really good network that's very good at calculating this input from input to output and furthermore interpolates um, for inputs that it hasn't seen. It does a pretty good job of, of predicting what the output would be. Okay, and so um, this is backprop. It's, it is the basis of most modern machine learning. And with this, we can do a bunch of stuff. There are other techniques that are, that are sometimes better, but generally is good. Um, and we can do three basic things. 
the first thing is the one I just showed you. It's, it's called supervised learning, where we know what the output ought to be. And there's two different versions of this. One is where we're trying to make some distinction. Is it an X or not? And then there's another one where we're trying to predict some number. What's the temperature tomorrow or something like that? Um, and so there's classification and regression. Another thing we can do with these things is not specify a, an output where we don't know what we're trying to get out of it. It's called unsupervised. Um, and mostly what that's used for is clustering. I can take some initial set of data and then break it up into pieces that cohere in some way or another. Um, and so unsupervised learning is largely about clustering. And so for supervised learning, uh, you know, the main thing you might find is something like face recognition here of this face, tell me whose it is or in a, in a more biomedical context, say diagnosing rectal fundograms has turned out to be a thing. So I take a picture of your retina, and I can look to see if you have diabetic retinopathy, little blebs on blood vessels or not, using one of these supervised classification techniques pretty well. Unsupervised, the clustering thing, use credit card fraud or anomaly detection for in the biomedical context, we can use it for doing subphenotyping, finding you know, collective groups of patients that make sense to treat uh, separately from other patients who have the same diagnosis. And then there's this sort of more complicated thing over here that you don't hear about as much, but I think is really important, called reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is to try and come up with a policy about what to do when you observe something in the environment, what action to take, in order to maximize some reward. And so that's, you know, you could imagine pigeons or mice or something like that trying to go out, and this comes from uh, the B.F. Skinner's re uh, world. Um, and the idea is we can come up with good reinforcement learning algorithms that come up with optimal policies if uh, the algorithm gets to explore the environment enough. And so this turns out to work really well when you have simulated environments that the algorithm can explore or a game where you can do self-play. So AlphaZero, um, the, the computer program that uh, beat the, is the best Go playing program, or best Go player in history, and, and uh, likewise, but one of the best chess programs was done on self-play and reinforcement learning. Um, it's really quite impressive what you can do, but you need enough of that. There have been a few applications of reinforcement learning uh, in the biomedical world. Probably the best one, best known one, is this one that was called the AI clinician, uh, which made treatment decisions in sepsis and has really sort of changed a lot of the way we treat sepsis. Um, instead of you know, starting with vasopressin and then doing fluids, we actually tend to do fluids first. And so this sort of shifted that paradigm a little bit. Anyway, um, that's enough history. Let me jump into the, the modern era. So we use this stuff to process language, to do various things with natural human languages. And uh, as you're probably familiar, there's a lot of things that are now language-oriented in your daily world. So, uh, you can say, hey, Siri, to your phone, what time is it? Or uh, get me an Uber to Hingston. And that mostly works, although somehow or another my pronunciation of, of British city names confuses Siri a lot. Um, and, uh, or you can order, that's an Alexa uh, from Amazon. So you can say, uh, uh, it turns out those are, are easily hackable. So I can walk into Nicholas's house, and he's got one of those things. And I can say, order me a case of Bordeaux, um, and poof. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, and some of the things that are really particularly useful, especially for those of us who travel a lot, are these translation apps, which are really remarkably good. Um, I still couldn't say that necessarily, but the, the computer could say it. Um, and uh, uh, furthermore, um, Google Translate isn't even state of the art. There's a really lovely uh, company out of Switzerland called DeepL, um, which does an even better job at translation. And this is, I think that this is miraculous. I, it really is amazing to me that it's possible to do this. And it's all been done uh, by these machine learning approaches. So machine translation, voice-based interfaces, and the like, um, they're really all based on those learning techniques now applied to very large amounts of language. And so I want to go into a little bit more detail about how that works. So this is a language model. It's the basis of pretty much most of these kinds of things. And what a language model is about really is context. It's not, context isn't everything, but context turns out to be an awful lot of what language use is about. Um, and the original idea for statistical language modeling actually came from Claude Shannon in 1948, the guy who uh, invented information theory. Because he was interested in communication over things like phone lines. He worked for the phone company. And so what a language model is, is a probabilistic model, these statistical language models, that say the probability of some sequence of words, 
um, is the sum of the, is the product of the probability of the first word times the probability of the second word given the first word times the probability of the third word given the first and second and so forth until the, prob the probability of the last word given all the previous ones. So what I can do is take a sentence and take the previous words and say, okay, what's the probability of this word given these words? Okay, and that's basically what a language model does, statistical language model. You all have these in your phones, okay? You have autocomplete, it'll suggest the next word when you're typing along. Um, those, by the way, are for the most part trained both on a general language model over English, or whatever language you're using, and your previous activities with the phone. So it remembers what you do and updates the probabilities based on that. So sometime when nobody is looking, I recommend that you all type into your phone, my research is, and see what the phone uh, suggests as what your research is. And uh, I'll, I'll fess up and say mine is on its way home for dinner. Um, <laughs> is what it is. All right, so um, it turns out that trying to do this statistically, this standard way, by looking at all the words in the dictionary and calculating the probabilities, the unigram probabilities are easy. I can look over a corpus of language and say, what's the frequency of the occurrence of this word? And that gives me a probability of each word. Okay, I can then do that for a pair of words. I can look at a word and what's the probability of the word following that, look at all of those and calculate that. There's a lot of those. So if there's 50,000 or so words in your language, there's 50,000 squared pairs. It gets pretty intractable once you get out to, the, to three or so. You might be able to do four in certain specialized language sets. But uh, these are hard to calculate, and so we tend to ignore the ones that are far away, and we approximate this um, with not word one, but word i minus three or something like that. And it works OK. Um, on the other hand, when we apply machine learning attempts to this, um, we can do much better. Um, and this is the advantage of being basically unsupervised. All, right? we, all we need is text, and then we can look to train a neural network model to predict what the next word is given the previous words. And that works ridiculously well. Um, and once you have such a model, you can do all kinds of things. You can not only predict what the next word is, you could take any sequence of words and calculate its probability. Does this look like it's English or not? Um, things like that. And it turns out there's lots you can do with this. Um, one way to make this more powerful is to try and, um, uh, let's see if I can slip, skip back a little bit. So uh, remember here I said the inputs can be anything. So typically in language, the way the inputs are set up are called one-hot encodings. So I take a dictionary, 50,000 words, and if the first word in my sentence is the, one of those 50,000 words is the, I turn that bit on and the other 50,000 bits are off. Okay, and so then I can do this for, I don't know, 10 words or something like that. It's a, a half million bit long input string, almost all of which is zero. Um, but that's, that's a simple way to represent language for a, a machine learning system. It turns out there are better ways. And one of them that's really taken over the world these days is called embeddings. Vector embeddings, word embeddings, you may have heard of this stuff. And the idea is pretty simple. I'm going to take context again. I'm going to take my one hot model here. Um, and then I'm going to force it through a much lower dimensional vector. If this is 50,000 inputs, or if I'm doing three words, 150,000 inputs, I'm going to force it into 10 uh, hidden nodes. And these are real values. They're not bits. And I will learn some matrix that allows me to compress into this vector representation, and then uncompress back out to pick the same word. So I can try and take a, a string of words and predict the middle one, or predict the end one, whatever it is. I'll come up with a vector representation of those words. And those vectors are really interesting. They capture the, the surrounding words. They capture the context. So my vector will be similar to your, my word vector will be similar to some other word vector uh, if the, the ways it's used, the places it shows up in text are similar. The words around it are similar. And so what that does is now projected down into two space, it gives you a map of all these words where similar words are close to each other. And so aubergine and, and steak and stuff like that will all show up in one place because they get used in the same context. Um, and things like foot and hand and eye will show up in the same uh, area in this vector space because they tend to get used in the same context and, and so forth. Uh, these vector spaces are, are good compact representations of these words that capture a lot of the semantics. So if I do something like calculate the cosine similarity of two vectors. Uh, that's a good measure of how semantically similar the words are. But there's a really cool thing you can do with these vectors that isn't obvious from them, which is you can do vector arithmetic on them. So not only uh, can I say that queen and king are pretty close together in this vector space, 
But if I take queen and subtract woman and add man, I get king. So you can actually do arithmetic in vector space to do these kind of semantic transformations. Um, and so using these vector space representations of not only words, we now do this for all kinds of things. You can pull the same trick on anything you can get sequences to provide context for. So you can do this over networks. If I do random walks from nodes in a network, a large network, I can do network embeddings and come up with these vector space representations of anything I have a lot of training data for. And the vector space representations have these lovely features of being able to do arithmetic and where cosine similarity matters and stuff like that. And so using this for, for language, whoops, wrong line, um, gives us these deep language models that have suddenly made a, a big impact in the world. 2019 was the year of, of deep language models. And so a bunch of them go by names from Sesame Street, uh, Bert and Elmo and somebody did Snuffleupagus. Um, uh, the one that got all the press in February of 2019 was one called GPT-2, uh, which was done at a place called OpenAI, which turns out, uh, always be suspicious of the names of things, turns out not to be very open at all. It's a commercial entity, and they were so afraid of how good GPT-2 was uh, that they didn't release it for almost a year. Uh, just, it was the final big version was just released late in the fall. Um, and they talked about all the kinds of, of problems it had. I'll go into those in a minute. Um, but what these deep language models can do is not only complete things. So uh, instead of your phone, you know, my research is, and then going off home for dinner or whatever, I type my research is um, into, into GPT-2. Uh, you can do this yourself, by the way. There's a website called Talk to Transformer. These are sometimes called transformer models. But Talk to Transformer lets you, lets you put in any kind of cue, um, and then will generate from GPT-2 um, uh, further text. And this is not true at all, but it's pretty coherent. Um, and uh, a lot of the things GPT-2 uh, or these other language models generate are remarkably coherent. There's a, um, uh, the, the paper that was about that described these things has an example uh, where the, the Q sentence or pair, set of sentences were about scientists discover a unicorn in the Andes. Um, and uh, we're surprised to find it speaks perfect English. And then GPT-2 wrote this very realistic-looking newspaper story interviewing the scientists around it. And um, it had some interesting little errors in it. So these are just statistical models. They don't know anything about what they're saying. Um, so one of the things that was uh, funny in the unicorn story is it mentioned that the first unicorn discovered was a four-horned unicorn. <laughs> hmm. But uh, it's also, and these, by the way, they're not word-based models. These are uh, the, for technical reasons, pairs of letters at a time models. So they capitalize beautifully, they use punctuation well, um, and it really, it reads like very coherent text production. And not only are they good at, at generating random text like this, um, but they do all kinds of other things well. You can use them for question answering. So if the input cue is a question, what it generates next is an answer to that question. It turns out to work pretty well. Um, you can do summarization. My favorite trick about the GPT-2 paper to do summarization was it was a text queue followed by TLDR. Um, and then what came after that was a summary of the text. Um, TLDR too long, didn't read, you know, email stuff for young people. Anyway. Um, and this was all trained on, on internet data. And I'll talk about that a bit in a minute. The training is really important for this. Um, because you want lots and lots of it. But this zero-shot learning is it can do all these things that other programs had been, uh, we had focused on question answering or summarization or uh, translation as separate tasks. And it turns out these deep language models are good at all of those things out of the box. And if you add just a little bit more learning, what's sometimes called transfer learning, so small amount of supervised data on top of it, you get, much, you get even better performance out of them. So these are... are uh, have changed the way we do uh, language processing testing. So instead of evaluating on these particular benchmarks, like I showed you before about question answering or translation or, or a sentiment detection or things like that, uh, we now do multitask evaluations. So the general language use evaluations, GLUE, came out right shortly after this. And then it turns out these language models were so good at all of those tasks, they had to come up with harder ones, and that's called super GLUE. Um, but so now we evaluate these models the same way we would look at a human using language, that is not just can you answer questions and not do anything else, but how well do you interact in language? How well do you answer questions, make comments, um, summarize things, detect sentiment, and so forth? Um, and it's really quite remarkable what, what these things are able to do. 
Um, and it's effectively unsupervised learning because you really just need text to train them, maybe a little bit more uh, to tune them. And when GPT-2 was released and OpenAI said, we're not releasing this because it's too dangerous, um, they were really worried about some real applications of this. So for example, uh, generating spam emails. The way we handle spam emails is they're very similar to each other. And we have basically a database that says, oh yeah, we've seen the Nigerian print scam before. Um, this is one of those. Um, and so GPT-2 allows you to generate new text every single time um, and, and generate as many of them as you like. There, so there, uh, this is a probability distribution on the outputs here. So there are many things that have very similar probabilities. In fact, the probabilities of most of these things are very close to zero. Um, but there, there are a bunch of them that are very similar. So I can generate hundreds or thousands of, of variations on this particular text very easily. And the variations are, are, are like language variations. They're, they're quite different from each other. Um, so things like spam or disinformation campaigns and the like um, uh, can take advantage of these things. That's true. Although I, I think the, the reason to put a halt to it was, was really to get the publicity for saying, oh, we've invented AI that's too dangerous to release, um, which certainly helped open AI, so to speak. All right. So there are a ton of biomedical applications of this stuff. It's all over the place. I want to point out Linguamatics, uh, which is actually a longstanding company that's been doing natural language processing um, for mostly biomedical and, and health applications for 20 years. And they were founded in and based in Cambridge. So it's a local, local operation. Um, and you can go visit their website and see all the stuff they want to sell you. Um, but uh, there are, there's lots of, lots of these uh, applications. Uh, one of the sad things about being along, around for so long is some of my papers are historic ones. So one, one thing you see, um, this is from 20 years ago, um, almost exactly 20 years ago exactly, was uh, using natural language processing to get information out of the literature. So the literature is so big that it's hard to keep track of all the stuff in it. Even in my narrow subfield, there are so many articles published that I basically go looking for them um, on, on sort of an as-needed basis. OK, what's the latest thing happening here or the like? It's really hard to keep up. And so if you're really, if it's important to have factual information, say about drugs or the like, um, out of the literature, it's um, as, as, boy, I'm taking coals to Newcastle, so to speak. It takes a lot of effort to curate that stuff, as you all know well here. Um, and so it's possible that these kinds of, of natural language processing techniques would help with that task. Um, this is about extracting information from the biomedical literature. Um, it's imperfect, but it scales really well. Um, and mostly it's been kind of used in coordination with human curators and the like to do things like systematic reviews, uh, evidence-based medicine, uh, gene ontology curation and the like, all, all of these things use uh, some kinds of natural language processing uh, to either identify documents or passages in documents or suggest annotations or the like. Um, it's not good enough for most of those purposes to take people out of the loop, but it's much more efficient to have people using NLP technologies than it is not. Um, another thing that, that turned out to be important, and this works better, is NLP on patient records. And so to try and phenotype patients, most of the important stuff in most electronic health records is in the notes. And so yes, some of the data is fielded about diagnoses and drugs and procedure codes and the like, um, but it's really a, a very fuzzy picture of what's going on with that patient. And more detailed pictures uh, can be done by doing natural language processing extraction. Um, and uh, as you can see, I love the new I'm sorry, I'm an old National Library of Medicine guy, so I'm going to, I'm going to tout this. I love the new PubMed interface they just released, um, which shows the, the publication history of your search. And so you can see this is really taken off, okay? NLP for, for phenotyping has had more papers in 2019 than probably in history before. Um, and these are often tied with GWAS studies or other kinds of genomic studies because we have these relatively large cohorts of patients. We'd like to know specific things about them phenotypically. Um, and NLP is really useful at, at, useful at pulling those out. Um, and they're getting pretty specialized even. And then there's uh, uh, other clinical applications. Um, so one of the ones I like is trying to surface uh, relevant portions of uh, voluminous electronic patient records uh, to people in emergency departments. So when you show up with chest pain in, in the emergency department and you have a huge fat medical record, it's all electronic, no doc is going to page through that to find the relevant stuff. They basically run the test by the, again um, rather than have to look through that record. And so it's a, 
There are systems now that try to surface relevant things to a particular complaint. So if you show up with chest pain, I'll look for uh, you know, cardiovascular disease relevant stuff in your history and try and surface that in a quick way. There are various other approaches to applying these natural language processing techniques on patient records. Um, there's some really fun stuff on NLP for public health, a little less of it. There's only uh, uh, this uh, NLP social media thing only came up with 42 results. I know there's more than that, probably not indexed in PubMed. Um, but these turn out to be really interesting, mostly mining social media. Um, you can do it for uh, disease outbreaks. You can do it for adverse events. Um, there are some uh, work going on. There's an adverse event reporting system. I imagine there is here too, but in, in the US, the adverse event reporting system is a required report for a ridiculous amount of stuff. So there are millions of adverse events reported every year. Um, and it's pretty easy to get the feeling that nobody at FDA actually ever looked at them um, because until, unless it was retrospective and you know, something bad happened. So we, you know, we missed uh, Celebrex, for example, until you know, doctors basically raised the alarm. Um, and so running NLP over these adverse event reporting systems uh, looks like it's going to improve our ability to early detect uh, things in pharmacovigilance or, or uh, you know, disease outbreaks and the like. It's pretty interesting. Um, some of them are hilarious. Uh, there's a Google flu tracker, I think. Uh, yeah, it's not on here, but there's, there are ones that uh, you can make really interesting predictions from these things. So for example, it's probably possible to predict whether you're pregnant or not based on your Twitter feed before you know. Uh, modern world. All right, so uh, what I've tried to do in the last 35, 40 minutes um, is give you some history and some current applications. And I'm going to take my computer scientist privilege um, and spend some time speculating about future ones for the rest of the talk. Um, and I, I want to be honest about this, okay? Computer scientists aren't actually scientists. If it has science in the name, it isn't one, okay? Political science, social science, we don't call it biological science, okay? But computer science is one of those. And the reason it's not really a science is because we're um, trying to understand things we invented ourselves, okay? We're trying to understand the performance of computer programs that we wrote. And that makes it a little bit different than trying to understand something um, out in the, in the natural world. And so, uh, that allows us to, to spend productive time, I'm going to call it scientifically, scholarly, in a scholarly way, talking about our plans and our ambitions for the code we want to write. And so what I'm going to tell you now for the next uh, I don't know, three or four slides um, is something that doesn't exist. I proposed it as an NIH grant. I will hear about it in April. Um, and that I hope I will get to build. And if I don't get it from NIH, I'm going to come to you guys to do this because I think it's such a great idea. But most bioinformatics so far has been largely about getting to the point where you, you have the results section of your paper, about analyzing sequence data or proteomics or whatever it turned out to be, putting those all together into something that gives you uh, understandable, good tables, charts, results. What I'd like to do is write programs that help you generate discussion sections. Okay? And there aren't very many tools for that. We have to think about them. But our thinking is limited. All right, it's limited mostly by our disciplinary boundaries. Okay? Most of the high impact papers in the world are interdisciplinary. And we do team science so I can talk about the thing I want to discuss, the results I found with, with colleagues or collaborators. But I think it's possible to use these language models to generate a sort of artificial collaborator who can discuss your results with you, or at least write a discussion section. So um, here's an example I used in the, uh, in the, in the application um, where I took a piece of a real paper um, that's in bold, and then let it generate uh, stuff. And I did a bunch of these, and this is not a cherry-picked one, by the way. I did this yesterday because I couldn't fit the example that I had in, in the application onto a slide. Um, they're pretty good. Um, they're not true. That's an important part. Um, but they sure do look like science. Um, and they're about the things that they're cued to be about. And they're in the neighborhood. They talk about, in this particular case, homology modeling and, and active sites, and it gets the protein right. Um, there, one interesting thing is it makes references to things. Here, table one, in, in longer ones, you'll find citations and like that are non-existent. There is no table one. And they'll give you citations, but they're not real citations, um, which is actually kind of funny, because they're real people's names and real dates and stuff like that. But you go look at the paper, and there's no such paper. So if we were going to try and turn some kind of computer modeling into something 
that didn't just generate nonsense like this, but was actually interesting and useful, um, then I think we would want to have them. And I think there's a path to get there. One of the interesting pieces about this is we can train on the entire biomedical literature. Okay, GPT-2 was hailed as being trained on a lot of data as it was trained on about 40 gigabytes of uh, human-generated text, which you'd think would be easy to find, but it turns out it was actually the hardest part of training the algorithm, was to find reasonable training text. So previous systems had used things like newspaper reports or the like, and those are very stilted, they're not like normal language, so it ends up producing things like newspapers, but that's not really very broad. Um, and then you could take, just scrape the internet and pull down text, but it turns out more than half the internet is fake. Okay, it's all up there for search engine optimization or, or ad, you know, getting ads and the like, and a great deal of text on the internet was written by computers already. Um, so what they ended up doing was taking Reddit posts that had at least four responses. And so a lot of Reddit posts are fake too, but Reddit posts that, that are involved in a dialogue turned out to be a good model of uh, just speech, and they got 40 gigabytes of those. But 40 gigabytes is nothing. Okay, the open access PubMed Central is 1.4 terabytes of text. Okay, we can train over all of the biomedical literature. Okay, we could get all of it in there. That's where the interdisciplinary piece comes from. Okay, so it'll be trained on everything there and generate stuff that comes from that probability model. And I think it could generate interdisciplinary connections that we wouldn't have good ways to generate otherwise. Now, the real trick, of course, is going to be making it accurate, okay? Generating nonsense isn't going to help anyone, even if it looks like science. And so I have a bunch of ideas about how we can improve the correctness of these things. And so I think larger training data will help, by the way. There's pretty clear evidence that even the, the GPT-2 model uh, hasn't reached the limits of what you could do to train it. Um, a, I won't go into the technical reasons, but there's technical measures that suggest it's, it's underfit. So more data would be helpful. Another thing we can look at are different loss functions. That's kind of a technical thing. Um, I won't bother going into that. We can do real transfer learning. Okay? So we can take some training data um, and say we'd like it to, to work more like our training data. And so, for example, we can have input cues that are paper up to the discussion section, and then the training example is the actual discussion section. So we can sort of drive these things more towards looking like real discussion sections. We can also do question answering. So there's a, tons of scientific exam questions out there. Um, if this really knows its science, it should be able to do a really good job of answering those scientific exam questions. And so if it doesn't, we can train towards those because we know what the answers to those exam questions are. We have tons of that stuff. And then I think the, a really fun piece is to try and use knowledge graphs. Um, you're probably familiar with those, but uh, symbolic representations of, of biomedical knowledge that relate things like tissues and diseases and drugs and physiologic functions and, and uh, pathways and proteins and all that sort of stuff. There's a bunch of them. Kebab is the one my lab generated, but there's, there's tons of these out there. There's a new one called Spoke that just got a ton of money um, from NSF at, uh, in partnership with Google and UCSF, so that'll be interesting to see what comes out of that. And we could use knowledge graphs in a couple of different ways. Uh, so one is we can generate arbitrarily large amount of factual, boring, simple factual statements. This protein is the product of this gene. This protein is localized in this tissue. Uh, this disease is a disorder of this set of, of enzymes, that sort of stuff. We can generate basically infinite amounts of that stuff from these knowledge graphs and use that as part of the training so that that basic factual information would be embedded in those statistical models. We can also use the architecture from the knowledge graph to do neurosymbolic learning, build the, the structure of the network so that it has the structure of those relationships that we know about uh, in it. And there's some interesting promise in there. And so all the symbolic guys who may be at the short end of the pendulum swing right now might actually have something useful to contribute to building these, these systems. One of the reasons to think that this might work um, is that science is perfectly documented. Okay? One of the problems with trying to build uh, general models like GPT-2 that are about all of humanity um, is that humanity has all this stuff that isn't written down anything. It's everything you know about the physical world you learned when you were five-year-old. Everything you know about the social world you learned when you were 15. There's no textbooks for any of that stuff. Okay? It's sometimes called the common knowledge problem. Um, and it's been really hard. Uh, computer science has been terrible at this and it remains fairly bad at it. Um, but biology and, or science generally has the advantage of everything we know about molecular biology is written down in a journal article or a textbook somewhere. 
I mean, a few things might be in somebody's lab notebook that haven't made the, the journals yet, but mostly it's all written down. And so we have the training data we need to make something that really could understand everything. Uh, one last uh, ambitious piece would be to have something you could actually communicate back and forth with, okay, a dialogue system. And so uh, this approach to language modeling just produces text, and it can produce answers to things, but it's not about coherent dialogue over time. And to have a real scientific partner, to have an AI we really wanted to talk to and interact with on an ongoing basis, we'd have to really be able to discuss things with it. And so there are some simple dialogue approaches. So you probably saw the announcement about Google Duplex, the thing that calls, uh, makes restaurant reservations for you in whatever language you want, um, or haircut reservations and things like that. It worked pretty well. Um, and so there are some simple dialogue things. You can, you know, you get on the phone with, you know, the cable company or whatever, and you'll, you'll see what simple dialogue systems look like. Uh, uh, they won't let you uh, cancel your subscription, forget it. Anyway, um, what we can do, start with, is language models plus some conversational conventions. And this has been sort of what's driving things now. The best dialogue systems do stuff like that. And then we might be able to use reinforcement learning. So remember that reinforcement learning loop um, it has rewards, and it does things that get it rewards. So the way that these dialogue systems that make restaurant reservations and the like work um, is there, there's a set of information that the system wants to convey, and the system on the other end of it has a set of information it needs to know how many people, what time, what day, that sort of stuff, any dietary restrictions. Um, and so there are a, a reinforcement learning approaches that use goal-oriented self-talk in order to get enough experience for the reinforcement learner to work. Um, and so those, those seem to work reasonably well. Um, there are a couple of examples that are out there in the world. So Microsoft has a, a game of 20 questions. You know, you think of something and it asks you questions to try and figure out what you're thinking of. It's trained on these sort of models. Works very well. It's hard as hell to beat that system. Um, and uh, uh, Museum of Science in Boston now has an interactive museum guide that's a dialogue model based on one of these things. It works okay. It's not great. Um, the reason these things are hard is it's really the ultimate challenge. That Turing test I alluded to right at the beginning is a dialogue test. Okay? It's about asking you about interacting and being able to tell whether, it, uh, you know, in a first order approximation, it's a person or a computer or a woman or a man or a computer, however deeply you want to think about these things. Um, and so uh, while some very limited forms of these Turing tests have been passed by systems like this, uh, it's, uh, in my opinion, it, it, is, it aligns what it is to be uh, thinking too closely with what it is to be human. Okay? The idea is to make it indistinguishable. And so if I were a judge in a, in a, a Turing test, uh, my first question would be ask, okay, so tell me about losing your virginity. Or if you haven't, how do you imagine it? Um, and every one of you has an answer to that. And you could go on for quite some time, and it would be quite different from everybody else's, and it would be kind of interesting. And no computer program is ever going to have a good answer to that question. And we could do other things that are sort of uniquely human. You know, tell me the last time you went to the bathroom and what was that like, stuff like that. Those would be really good Turing test questions if you wanted to pick out a human versus a computer. But they don't really matter that much in terms of dialogue about a scientific system. So it's a little hard to measure how good these dialogue systems are to figure out what the reward function is. Um, it's not clear how far we can go with biomedical uh, material alone. But it would be really important for these systems to be able to discuss their discussion sections. Um, and the like. And so this is an important out there challenge. And I do want to note um, that figuring out differences is going to be interesting. One of the challenges here for, say, the GPT-2 worries about spam and disinformation and the like is it's impossible, sort of in a, uh, by the nature of the design, to tell the difference between a GPT-2 output and human text statistically. They are intended to be indistinguishable, and they are. It's very hard to tell. On the other hand, um, in general, on the other hand, you could use the language model itself to assign probability to utterances. And you could see what the probability is for an individual language model and an individual utterance. Uh, so what the probability is that that model would generate that utterance. You could also look at it in a ranked way. How, where would it be on the list of utterances it might generate? Um, and that's, that's useful because you can actually tell uh, if that language model generated that text reasonably well. But it's really easy to change the language model. Okay? So I can train it on a different order of the data, different random initiations. It's easy to generate millions of different language models. Um, and they would not be, in general, distinguishable from human text. But they're distinguishable from each other, which is kind of interesting. You can, tell what one, you can use one to tell whether it generated that utterance. 
And so they they're each have their own sort of perspective, the sort of thing that they would generate. They're all different from each other. Sort of like minds, you know, and all minds are different. Even identical twins have totally different minds from pretty much the get-go. And so it might actually be useful um, to have multiple language models in the scientific context. They would have different things to say. And we could imagine, imagine pushing back a little bit on this interdisciplinary thing and say, well, let's have more disciplinary ones. I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a cancer guy. I want to talk to a cancer understanding model. Or I'm an immunologist. Or uh, I'm interested in ancestry or whatever. And so we could, use, we could make multiple language models and add a little bit of a disciplinary angle back in so it would be more likely to generate things from those perspectives. Um, and you know the sort of ultimate fantasy about these things, and if they were going to turn out um, to be individualizable, I would want one that knew what my interests were, okay, that was specific to me. And the way to do that is a language model or some dialogue agent language model and something else that learns from being used. As I use it, it changes. It figures out what I like and don't like. Um, and we could actually do this. Um, the problem with doing this is it it has, it has real issues. So I don't know if you remember Tay, the Microsoft chatbot, but Microsoft put a chatbot up on the internet, and within 24 hours, um, it, was, it was horrible, okay? It was, uh, you know, all the trolls went after it, and it was spitting out all this, you know, obscene, racist, sexist stuff, basically, you know, your worst porn nightmare. Um, and uh, so how do, how do we prevent that from happening? How do we, if we're going to have our our language models be able to learn from their interactions, and we can't really trust their interactions, what do we do to keep them from having this problem? And there are some really interesting approaches to this right now. I don't know if you read the same kids' magazines as I did, but the, there's this uh, thing called Goofus and Gallant in a magazine called Highlights, which was little cartoons aimed at children about how to sort of be a good person versus not so good. And they were supposed to be real ethical dilemmas. Okay, that kids might face. This one is about you know practicing something or giving up practicing, um, and there are tens of thousands of these things. And so um, there's an interesting effort that was just posted on, on uh, archive I don't know, a couple weeks ago, uh, using this to try and train up a model um, that had the same values that were expressed in in these. And so um, we can we can try if we're going to allow our models to learn, uh, we trust other people when they learn things to improve. Mostly, maybe not teenagers. Um, but we can't trust programs to improve by learning things. They may go off and learn the wrong things. And what does that mean? How can we figure out how to say, don't learn that, learn this? And maybe coming up with these ways of aligning values of computer programs, as it were, um, statistical only, not, I don't mean moral values here, but with our moral values, this might actually work and help us generate better sorts of texts. And so we're going to have to figure out if they're going to drift and be able to learn things. We don't want them to become anti-vaxxers. Okay. And so I'm, I'm going to end with a cautionary note. Okay. This natural language processing stuff, I've been talking about applications that I think can advance science, improve patient care, change the way medicine works, change the way we understand the natural world. But there are other applications, and I would be uh, remiss if I didn't point out what I think is the most important one. So these two articles were published now eight years ago, 2012 and 2013, um, by Facebook. And they demonstrate some really impressive damage that you can do with language models. Okay, so they planted subliminal cues and manipulated social comparisons in Facebook pages. And that influenced users to vote in a midterm election, that's the first article, and to make people feel happier or sadder, that's the second one. And not only was it possible to manipulate online cues to influence real-world behavior and real-world feelings, it was possible to do it without the users noticing. They didn't know. Okay? And Facebook, they, they ran into a shitstorm for publishing this stuff. Okay? So they stopped publishing it. They issued an apology. You know, there was no IRB. They didn't ask for anybody's uh, uh, permission to do this kind of work. Um, there, were, there were 60 million people in one of these experiments. Um, but don't think for a minute they stopped doing it. They just stopped publishing about it. And they're not the only ones who do this stuff, OK? So it is really possible. We have demonstrated it's been possible for at least eight years now to modify the feelings and behaviors of very large numbers of people. And basically, that ability is for sale, OK? You can buy that. And uh, it's more expensive than even Nicholas can afford individually. Um, but nevertheless, powerful corporations who want to sell you stuff, uh, powerful governments who want to move particular ideas, other powerful actors, billionaires, whoever, um, 
have access to this technology. And we're going to need to think really hard as a society about how we're going to deal with the fact that it is possible to do this. And uh, I raise this because it is a natural language processing kind of application. It's just not in biology and medicine. But with that, I, I hope I've uh, taught you a little history, intrigued you about what's possible, scared you a little bit about what's possible, and I would love to take your questions. <laughs>